Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Thomas Allen Harris, host of Family Pictures USA. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this special event in honor of LGBTQ History Month. We have a special and a great line. Uh, we have a great lineup of special guests tonight, who will be sharing their photographs and stories, including filmmakers Jenny Livingston and Arthur Dong, and photographer Lola Flash. We're hosting this event with community media partners Third World Newsreel, a nonprofit media art center promoting media by and about people of color and social justice issues, and the documentary forum at CCNY. This event is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, NISCA, and DCA. We invite you to support the work of Family Pictures USA by clicking the link in the Facebook Live caption to make a donation. We love that. <laughs> um, if you want to share your photos and stories celebrating LGBTQ history, because we all have that, uh, including our allies, with our Family Pictures community, please join our Facebook group. The need to show and speak of our history and family stories as part of the rich diversity of American life and culture is more critical now than ever. Regardless of the political currents, queer lives and communities are always on the edge of marginalization by the culture at large. There is a long and proud tradition of LGBTQ and queer people of color marching in the vanguard for our rights just to be. We're continuing to celebrate our ancestors and shine a light on the new guard, moving us forward in a more just and equitable world with our special guest. First up is Arthur Dong, author and pioneering queer filmmaker whose films include License to Kill and Coming Out Under Fire, and who also has a new book, Hollywood Chinese. Arthur, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Thomas. I love your show. It's, it's, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of one of them. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. you. It's wonderful to have you here. here. Tell us what photograph did you bring first? Uh, this is from 1970. It's actually a clipping from a 1970 gay paper in San Francisco called the Gay Free Press. And this is a, the first time one of my photographs was ever published. I was 16 years old. I had been taking pictures for about a year at this time, taking lessons in high school. And uh, this photograph is actually a, a collage. Uh, you, in the back is, for those who know, this is, that's Jean Harlow, a, a, a starlet from the 1930s. And I was a big fan of Jean Harlow. On the bottom, you see the uh, Kodak uh, film edge from the 35 millimeter film, which I was developing. Uh -huh. And you see a multi-exposure of me. Uh, so this was my self-portrait that I made uh, in 1970. Uh, and um, the editor, who I was kind of dating, uh, published this. And uh, plus, I think about five more other photographs. And you were also out during, during this time. time. I'm sorry? You were also You're out during this time. time. It says Arthur is a gay 16-year-old. Yeah, it's, um, I was, when I, found this again, I said, wow, I guess I was out. <laughs> I mean, I had been gay for as long as I could remember, uh, but I guess this was the, kind of an out thing. Um, and um, it's, it's kind, kind, of, of, kind of kind of weird, weird actually. <laughs> um, that was 50, 50 years ago. ago. Wow. Um, yeah. And it seems like we have a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure why that is. Um, Let's go to the next photograph. Uh, this is from my new book, Hollywood Chinese. Mm -hmm. And in, in the middle is Esther Ring. She was born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, and she, uh, she was born in 1914. And uh, when she was just 22, she made her first film in Hollywood. Uh, and she continued to make about eight or 10 films, both here in San Francisco uh, and in Hong Kong. And she did, that, did it as an open lesbian. And it's just amazing that she did this in the 30s. And I profile her in my book. Uh, and um, with her... How did you know she was queer? I'm sorry? How did you know she was queer? Could, just from the research and articles and people who work with her uh, and the articles of that time in her era, gossip columns, particularly in Chinese, that uh, 
says, yes, she romanced her stars and she just walks, she dresses in, in manly clothes and she just was totally open. It's, and I found it astounding that she did this in San Francisco Chinatown in the 30s in the Chinatown Chinese community. Uh, and no one really, as far as I could tell from the research, bat an eyelash. Uh, and uh, she just did this until, in fact, she died in 1970 and she became a restaurateur in New York City. She opened various restaurants in Chinatown. And um, there was a book uh, where she's referenced. Then uh, the author says, oh yeah, I remember Esther, we used to go to her restaurant, she, her girlfriends would manage the place. And it's just an astounding story. So and really reminds me that there were just so many stories in history that we don't know about. Mm, well, thank you for this great work. Let's go to the next slide. This is Jackie Mai Ling. And this is from my, my first book, Forbidden City USA, about Chinatown nightclubs in the 40s during World War II. And, uh, and he was a dancer. Uh, but what you see there is him in drag. And uh, he performed infrequently in drag. In fact, he told me that he once performed at Finocchio's in the early days. The Finocchio's is kind of, um, they called themselves female impersonators at that time. But it was a pretty, pretty well-known nightclub that actually crossed over to the mainstream and 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 where it was quite popular with people who wanted to see female impersonators uh, as a show. Uh, and um, but I, 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 it was really interesting when I met Jackie. I met him in 1985 in my research, mm -hmm. and he just reminded me of this gay uncle that I never had. He has just wonderful stories about being gay in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. He didn't want that to be part of the documentary, but he openly talked about it. Uh -huh. um, so, um, you know, and it reminded me that gay people from that generation weren't, when they were open, they were open in a different kind of way that we know ourselves to be out of the closet today. Uh, it's a different mindset, it's a different way of, uh, of, of being in, amongst the community as an openly gay person. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. Yeah, yeah things change, change so significantly. So uh, let's uh, go let's to the next photograph. photograph. Uh, this is um, also from my uh, book for Bin City USA about the Chinatown nightclubs. This is Toyette Marr. And she was a singer and she she's she was the belter. She was she was they nicknamed her the Chinese Sophie Tucker. And I, I really love this photo of her, the older photo. Because if you look closely, you see a bare light bulb in the corner there, uh -huh. and the background is like uh, unfinished wood, and you know she's in this very butch outfit, which she never performed in. As far as I know, I've seen dozens of photographs of her performing, and she's never, as far as I I know, performed in masculine clothing. It was always gowns and sequins, uh, uh, but here she is in this very butch outfit with a cigarette, and it doesn't look like. You know, I'm making this up, but it reminds me of some underground lesbian bar behind secret doors. And uh, I just love the photograph. And both the photograph, her, the contemporary photograph of her and Jackie Mai Ling, the previous one, mm -hmm. the photographs that I took. And although I became a filmmaker, I continually took photographs. And uh, I just couldn't, and, and whenever I would visit, um, people for my films, I would photograph them as well. Do they end up in, in your book as, as, as a photograph that you take as well? Yeah, they're, they're in my book. Um, and the, uh, I mean, my book is mostly the older photographs, mm -hmm. but in their profiles, I, I include the contemporary photos that I took of them. So they're part of the family. Yeah. And, the and it, what's interesting is that they, they talked to me off camera about, but I recorded these interviews about gay life uh, during the 40s, but they asked me not to put it in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, but their stories are in the book. Uh, and, um, but again, with, with, with Tori, she lived in Fresno with her partner and she called her a partner, but they were definitely a couple. And, um, 
And it's interesting the way they live their lives, which is very different from uh, gay people today who live their lives really out and unabashed. They led lives that were comfortable for them mm -hmm. and within their own uh, uh, comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Let's, Let's go, go forward, forward with, with a photograph. Okay, this is from Coming Out Under Fire. And I love this photograph. Um, on the left is Alan Barabee. The author whose uh, whose book I based the film on, Coming Out of Fire, which is about gay and lesbian soldiers in World War II. Mm -hmm. In the middle is Sue Davis, uh, who is a, uh, a military veteran. Uh, that's me. Uh -huh. And um, this is the picture. And, then, and that's Sue Davis. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah Davis, not Sue Davis. It's Sarah Davis. And on the far right is Sarah Davis in the military in World War II. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like for, especially for what we're doing here, because I've seen your shows before and I've seen your website and the photograph of us reminds me of the photographs you have with you and your subjects, just looking over old photographs of people's personal histories and pulling them out and making them a part of a larger history, which is, uh, which is Sarah's story as, as a, a, a veteran of World War II. Yeah, it's yeah, so, so important that, that you know, know we as storytellers story bring the archive out and, and, and celebrate people who have the stories story behind them, and especially you know our queer ancestors or our you know um, uh, ancestors who are you know, uh, you know, people of color whose stories are not part of the mainstream. Yeah, and you know, and it's the same thing with Sarah as with Toy and Mar and Jackie and Myling, they led gay lives within the comfort zone of their times. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that was a learning curve for me as a younger person than them to realize that, you know, that they were open too. They were out of the closet too, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in a way I felt comfortable with in my own life, but mm -hmm. they, they had their own standard. And for them to have struggled in their times and to actually have gay friends, lesbian friends, and, and to socialize amongst themselves, that was pretty, for them, radical for their time. And I really had to appreciate that in terms of historical context and timeline. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, Arthur. Arthur. We have one last photograph. Oh, we have two more, I think. Oh, two more, okay. okay. This is almost the last. This is, this is one of my favorite photographs. This is when um, I was working on the PBS series, The Question of Equality. And I was in charge of uh, producing and directing the first episode, which focused on Stonewall. Mm -hmm. And this is a photograph of me and Sylvia Rivera. Sylvia Rivera was a, um, I think in her time, she called, it, they called themselves drag queens. Uh, and I'm not sure what she would call herself today, if she was still alive. Uh, she passed away, I think in uh, uh, 2002. And, but this was the, um, the march um, celebrating Stonewall in New York City, the 25th anniversary. And, and she was part of that history, too. too. Yeah, and, and she was one of the first participants at Stonewall. And mm -hmm. I, had, I had just interviewed her. I was just about to interview her for the documentary, mm -hmm. um, which is how we came to know each other. And, and this, is, this march, there were three marches that year because they couldn't, figure out what to do because there was still so much in uh, in community uh, fighting or disagreements. So there were three marches. There was the kind of the Main Street March that year, and mm -hmm. there was the Dyke March. And then there was the, at that time, I'm not sure what terminology they used, but I think they called it the Drag March. Mm -hmm. And the Main Street March didn't want the other two groups in the Main Street March. So they all three marched like parallel on different streets. Mm -hmm. And well, I, I joined the drag street, the, the, the drag queen march, of course. <laughs> and you know, what, what's, and working on, you know, that, that was so emblematic of the conflict that I was trying to f explore in the documentary of Stonewall, mm -hmm. in that the different communities within the gay community at that time were, there was a lot of infighting. There was a lot of disagreements in terms of people of color, uh, whether you were a drag queen, whether you're transgender, and were, uh, whether you were uh, a, a white male. I mean, they, they all had disagreements, and it was interesting because 
those were the issues that I focused on in the documentary. And we actually had the showing. Mm -hmm. We had the premiere showing in New York City. I think it was NYU, the, the one of the larger auditoriums at NYU. After the screening, they were still arguing. It was like, and I think they're still arguing today. Yeah. Well, listen, we have one last photograph. And, and so, so tell us this, this last photograph, it looks like a wedding, a wedding picture. Well, this is my wedding. Well, our wedding, <laughs> not just mine, but our wedding. And this is in 2008 in California, when there was a small window of time that we were allowed legally to get married. Uh, I forget what the legal parameters were, but there was a big threat that we were allowed to get married. It was, a, I don't remember the specifics, but there was, there was only a few months a few months of window. So we took that advantage of that window. And uh, what you see there on the lower right, on the lower left is, is our son, and he was our ring boy. Uh -huh. And then my husband, Young, and myself in the middle. And Judy Chu, Congressman Judy Chu is in purple. And uh, this was her first gay wedding that she officiated. And, oh, uh, wow. and next to her is Amy Hill, the actress. Uh -huh. uh, and then her daughter in the lower right corner. And uh, this is, instead of doing vows, we didn't do traditional vows because it was kind of silly for us. Uh -huh. We had a kind of a Q&A. And, and, and this is a moment when we were doing a Q&A. I guess it was a funny moment because... <laughs> uh, it looks like you're singing. <laughs> no, no, we were answering a question. I forget. I, I don't. I, I have to look at the videotape to see what question we were answering. But you can see that Amy and Judy uh, have paper in their hands. They had a list of questions they were going to ask us. Um, and wow. I guess it was. A, I have to look it up and see what question they were asking. Well, Arthur, thank you so much for sharing some of your family album and family from your archives with us today, helping us build it queer family album. Well, really, it's my pleasure. I'm glad that it's a part of the larger picture. It's so it's great, great to have you here. here. Yeah, likewise. Okay, okay. okay. so okay. our so next I'm guest here. is, um, our next guest is actually uh, Lola Flash, a photographer whose work focuses on social LGBT and feminist issues that document and celebrate LGBT lives and was also featured in the film Through a Lens Darkly, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People. Lola, welcome. Hey, how are you? You're muted. I'll try that again. I, I can hear you. All right. And it seems like my echoes disappeared too. <laughs> yeah, that sounds better. I helped you. So welcome, Lola. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, and it's really great to be working with you again. Yeah. So tell us, what's the first photograph you brought that you're going to talk tell us about? Um, I wanted to talk about pride. Sorry mm -hmm. about the, the siren going by. No problem. Because mm -hmm. for this me, is a photograph from Pride. Which Pride? Mm, I would say maybe two or three years ago. Uh huh. Is it um, in the uh, West Village? Yeah, it's in the West Village. Um, I was in that area where they have the little sort of market area. Uh huh. Um, and I was sort of, uh, I think I was on my way to my friend Afua's house. She always has a party every year. She lives in West Beth. Oh, um, yeah. So I was Press just on you know, so my, my, my way there, and I saw these two, and I was just like, do you mind if I take a picture? And they were like, fine, and they posed. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, pride is always, well, throughout my life, I sort of gone in and out of just being super excited about pride and then not so, so surprised, I suppose, just whatever's going on in my own mind. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a really wonderful time to, to celebrate us all and to be able to see all the different kinds of queer folk that there are out there, you know, um, and, and the, feel like um, us people of color really show up, you know, so it's, so I thought I wanted to include a little bit of that because that is part of my family. Absolutely. Let's go to the next photograph. Wow, so sweet. Yeah, I mean, I see the world with rainbow colored glasses. glasses. You know, check wow. out my view, you know? Um, and uh, so I, I generally tend to do some pictures of, of, you know, the parade. And then since I am a portrait photographer, I often will try to, you know, stand near uh, an area where I can, like, get a nice background and photograph people on their own. How long have you been photographing Pride? Oh, gosh. 
I don't know, since the 80s, I guess. I mean, oh. yeah. I mean, my first Pride in New York, I think, was probably 83 or 84. And, and I think that's also one of the things that, that I like about Pride because I think about how I felt my first Pride. Pride mm -hmm. And I think about, like, every Pride there is, you know, people, there's always someone who's it's their first Pride. And feeling nervous, I remember thinking, like, well, back in those days, you know, they didn't televise Pride. Um, and, you know, you if someone was home, you'd say, oh, did you see anything on, on the news about Pride? And of course they hadn't, you know. No, no. and it was before streaming as well. So you wouldn't see it, you know, anywhere. You had to be, you had to have been there. Speaking of um, seeing, I love your glasses. Are those LA Works? You know, I have to, all of my glasses are except for this pair. Okay, well, mine are LA Works. They're one of our sponsors actually, and I, I love them. I love them. <laughs> Too. I have a, a whole like amazing a collection of collection. Let's go to the next photograph. Wow. Now this is this from the series uh, Surpassing? Is this your Surpassing series, or is this a series that, that came after that? Yes, this came after that. This is Surmise. Um, so Surmise is uh, focuses on gender queer folks, and it looks at sort of the disturbing rep representation or really misrepresentation of of our community. Um, so, you know, sort of in plain talk, it's about um, people who are gender fluid and for some reason, society always feels the need to put, put us in a box. You know, um, myself personally, I mean, all my series are about myself and personally, uh, for instance, when I go to the bathroom, the ladies are like up in arms and they're like, you're in the wrong bathroom and they're really mean to me, you know? And, at that point, I'm not being a polit you know, I'm not thinking about my politics. I'm just thinking about my physical needs. Yeah. You know? And um, I mean, that this has happened all my life in every country I've ever been to. Um, you know, I remember in Germany, this lady was saying, Fräulein, Fräulein. And I was just like, I am a Fräulein, you know? Um, and, you know, it's, you know, we can laugh about this situation because it's not going to change. I mean, it might kind of mess up my day or my moment, but it's not going to change my bank account. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm so happy that there are gender fluid bathrooms in many places. Um, but it's, as far as I'm concerned, unless you're gonna date someone, it doesn't really matter what gender they are, what sexuality they are. Um, and so it started off me photographing queer folks. Um, and then um, there's two of my friends who are straight, but because they have a lot of queer friends, whenever they hang out with their queer friends, people always think they're gay. You know, so this is this kind of this association, which is kind of like, um, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm kind of playing around with that and, and hoping that eventually people will get to a point where they just kind of see the love in our hearts. Mm. Let's go to the next photograph. So, so this, is, this, is, this is actually something different now. This is a different body of work. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, I always say that, that um, you know, each model is like a little part of me. Like when I see someone, I see this little like little gem of me inside of them. So it's almost all of them feel in a way like self portraits. Um, so salt is about older women. They're all over 70 and it's about um, seeing their beauty. You know, mm -hmm. these women all are, um, you know, well, Norma, actually, oddly enough, both of these women have passed. Um, but before they passed, Norma on the left hand side, um, she lived in Puerto Rico. You can tell by the flag. Mm -hmm. uh, this is her home. I mean, I, I walked in and I was just like, I know we're going to shoot. Uh, sometimes I say, you know, where do you usually hang out at? And, the, you know, some people choose the kitchen or whatever. But that was just made for a photograph. Um, she was a singer and she made an incredible a cookbook. She was also a painter. Uh, and I love her little doll there at the, in the corner. I mean, the whole wall is gorgeous. Amazing, right? Yeah. And then on the right hand side, we have Tony Parks, who is Gordon Parks' daughter. Well, I, met, I met in the 80s, actually, 80s and, and, and 90s. A, a phenomenal lady. Totally. She was a real firecracker. And, um, you know, you see there on her mantle, her, uh, her herself and her father. Uh, there's also a little uh, pen, uh, Obama pen. And uh, this was taken in her home in, um, in Turkey, um, in England. Um, yeah, I, I miss the, both of them. But, you know, the thing is, is that me as a female thinking about like what I'm going to be like when I grow up, so to mm -hmm. speak, and also just thinking about the way that society, you know, we, they sort of love women when they're like 18 to 28, and then they kind of 
push those women aside and bring in a whole new host. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas someone like George Clooney, who I think is handsome, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we don't have a lot of women who have that kind of like, um, society doesn't see the beauty, right? You don't see an older uh, co-star um, mm -hmm. with a, a female, with a younger man, you know what I mean? You always see the opposite, these gray haired guys, with these young girls, and, you know? And so it's about reminding these women about their beauty. So like that, that two hours that I'm with them, I'm like, I'm here, I'm Lola Flash, and I'm photographing your beauty. Cause I think that sometimes they forget you know, beautiful. Let's go to the next photograph, which I think is uh, is is a new as another body of work. This is you on the on the left, on the right rather, and and on the left. Yeah. So tell us about this 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 project. So this is a new series, my latest series called Syzygy: The Vision, and it's um, referencing Afrofuturism, thinking about. Uh, creating a, a future that is equitable. Uh, you know, basically, for those don't, who don't know, Afrofuturism uh, has been around forever. People like Sun Ra, you know, some of the original people, um, G George Clinton, uh, Missy Elliott, um, you know. And so we, we as black and brown folks, were, weren't able to write our stories. And then those stories that you read were often left out or sort of misaligned. And mm -hmm. so the the beauty, uh, the excitement about Afrofuturism for me is that, you know, I can take those past stories and the present stories and kind of reweave them and create this kind of beautiful and not perfect future. Because I don't think there's anything called about, I don't think things are perfect, but mm -hmm. I think that for me, what I see would be what would be perfect for me would be an equitable society. Mm -hmm. and I love the water in the background and the open cuff, you know, freedom. Uh, so the last two images are family images. So, so, um, so who is who is in these two? Who is who? Who are these two folks? Well, Thomas, <laughs> that's uh, that's me on the right hand side uh, with long hair. Yeah, <laughs> long hair and a dress. <laughs> And that's my beautiful mom, who was a teacher, a principal. Um, you know, she and my dad gave me the love of, of education. Um, you know, I'm a lifetime learner. Um, and they gave me my manners. Um, and so, um, you know, this picture shows mom and I kind of dressed alike. She used to like to dress us alike. I wish I could find the picture of us with these dashiki dresses on, like from the 70s that I used to love to wear. Um, but to be honest with you, this was probably one of the last pictures that I actually had a dress on, you know, um, because I told my mom, like, I think as soon as I was able to, to form a sentence that I didn't like wearing dresses, you know, and she was like horrified. She's like, you know, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that, you know, and so my How parents- you, Like around six, five, six? I or think, I'm thinking even younger, you know, uh, really uh -huh. did not like dresses. and. Um, you know, and my dad would just take me straight to we go shopping. I wouldn't have to fluff around the girls department. My dad would take me straight to the boys department and I would buy my jeans and my, you know, my overalls and, you know, my plaid shirts. And, um, you know, for me, um, you know, now I suppose I would just I say that I wear masculine clothes. Um, but for me, this is the kind of, of woman that I am. And so I think a lot of people often misgender me because of the way that I dress. Um, and, and that's understandable. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of people who are trans who actually feel like they were born in the wrong body, right? They want to change to the, to the other gender. But um, for me, it's, it's all about like exploring like what my, my terms are around being a woman. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it was, it's, it's, I suppose thinking too about the family, you know, um, when your family is behind you, uh, it just makes all the difference in the world because I never had any problems with thinking like I was weird or strange. Mm -hmm. you or know, exiled or, from your family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or exiled from your family. Yeah, because, no. because of your self-expression. Yeah, no. because of expressing who you were. So let's go to the la last photograph. Mm -hmm. And you can continue. So this is a photograph of a famous person in here, or two famous people, right? Three. It, Three is um well in the center is uh, Booker T Washington, and is that Madam C J Walker on the left? That is yes. And, and who 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 else is in here that 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 we should know? 
Well, you should know my great grandfather, Charles H. Charles H. Bullock. He's the one with the mustache. Um, and far to the right. Far to the right. Okay. Yes. Um, and he he was responsible for uh, founding several YMCA's uh, YMCA's around the country. One in Brooklyn. Uh, one in Montclair and Louisville, Kentucky, I think. Um, and the, at the time they were called the, uh, the colored wise. So that was jury segregation. This photograph is from about 1920. And I think that uh, they were probably um, there, those, the other folks were probably there because they probably donated some money towards the building of the uh, YMCAs. Um, uh -huh. and so my grandfather went around the country, you know, making these, uh, founding these YMCAs and, uh, you know, from what I hear in Montclair, I know they were kind of like the meccas for black and brown people. You know, there was no place for them to go. Um, they learned how to read. They learned how to swim. Um, many people were able to get scholarships, um, you know, and it was a place where they could actually commune, um, you know, as like just kind of normal everyday people rather than feeling so alienated where they did most places. Um, so, you know, we're really proud of my family and I know some of them are watching. Hi, Charlene. Um, and some of my friends, it's, you know, that's also my, my family's, my friends and, you know, those people I don't know and those people who are here for me all the time. But, um, you know, I think that having a great grandfather like that for, for us and, and our family, the Bullock family, you know, it's like he's kind of, he passed this baton down to us, you know? And so it's this legacy that says like, my great grandfather in 1920 knew that we deserve more, that we deserve a more equitable future. And I can't say that more, you know, enough. Um, and so for me, I, you know, in this 21st century, it's, I feel it's important for me to, to carry that torch and to wave it proud, you know? And so it's, it's um, yeah. And I, and I always say, if you don't have someone in your family that, that has created that legacy, then maybe you're the person that's gonna create that legacy for the people to come from, you know, to come. Oh, shame. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. shame. I love it. I Thank you. It's like, it's, I love the ending with that photograph of service and, and pride and also ex acceptance and uh, leadership, and which all of which you embody with your work. Lola, love you. Thank you, love you too, sweetheart. Okay, so our next guest is Jenny Livingston, a dear friend and an award-winning filmmaker whose groundbreaking film, Paris is Burning, was included in the film registry at the Library of Congress in 2016 and was released by the Criterion Collection in 2020. And I was part of that release. I did a, a, a Q&A with some of the cast members of the film. Jenny, welcome. You're muted. <laughs> You're muted. Folks, and those pictures is really exciting and I'm on it. It's so great to have you here. Mm -hmm. uh, so where where are you hailing from right now? Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. Okay. And I've left it. for a long time now. <laughs> I know this COVID thing is so intense and, and it's getting more intense right now. Um, so it's, I'm really happy, like, you know, that we are all coming together to allow one another to see you know, ourselves in these spaces, but also beyond the spaces through our photographic albums and collections. And, um, and you have a, an image that, um, that you, the first image, which takes us back to the eighties, right? Yeah. So all the images I'm going to show today are from the film I'm making now, Earth Camp One, which is a first person film, kind of a memoiristic film. It's about loss and how I lost a lot of family members, but also larger circles of loss and how we deal with loss collectively. And in this case, in activism, um, I was a young photographer making my first film, but also an activist with ACT UP. Mm -hmm. And as everyone knows, you know, uh, the uh, AIDS crisis started with the gay male population um, and queer population and um, people rose up to say, you know, no, the president of the United States should say the name AIDS. And, you know, we can't just say, well, so what if people are dying? It's in a, it's in a community, we, we being, you know, the mainstream, not me, but don't care about. And so ACT UP was very, very effective in making people see the images and also, you know, Dr. Fauci, who is always in the news now. I mean, those of us who are AIDS activists then remember Dr. Fauci because we called him out and he listened. 
You know, he, he listened uh, as, a, as a public health official. Mm -hmm. So I was photographing at that time and it was moving to photograph what I was part of. Yeah, it was also during that time, because I, I think around that time we met and there was a lot of like, you know, exchange thinking about what Arthur mentioned earlier, you know, between like, you know, uh, the dykes and fags, right? It was a lot of like, you know, people, you know, women were supporting gay men who were like fighting, you know, had, you know, who were principally the ones who was, uh, you know, suffering from, you know, AIDS and, and HIV at that time. And so in thinking about, you know, this, that, that what Arthur mentioned about the different um, parade, you know, we've got, gone apart and I think in some ways are coming back together perhaps. Well, and also I wanted to say, I directed an episode of the show Pose um, where in that script, which I did not write, I just directed it, uh -huh. um, was you know there were some ball kids who get involved with act up and go to go to an action but you know that's sort of total poetic license that never happened i mean i'm not saying everybody in the ball world or everybody in act up but i did not know one single person who straddled both worlds they were very different worlds and the people like larry kramer who founded act up were white men with a lot of education and privilege who felt you know entitled to say, you have to pay attention to us. We thought we were gonna die in our beds at old age and now we're not, you know, please let's pay attention and, and you know, cure this disease. Let's move to the next photograph. So that's also ACT UP. And these pictures, I didn't even, it's funny, I shot them back in the eighties. They were like sitting in cans of film, not processed until, you know, like five years ago. And, you know, that's a, a man, ACT UP activist, being arrested, um, it speaks for itself. I mean, this is happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think images from Portland or other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean that era when people were putting were putting our bodies on the street speaks to this moment, and mm -hmm. I think speaks to the necessity of you know we need to do that. Um, this still changes minds and it changes hearts, and it certainly creates imagery for us to go out and say, um, you know, we can't, we can't, we will not conscience these oppressive systems that allow people or even deliberately, you know, allow people to die or kill people. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next photograph. Okay, so this is coming up to last year, and this is a family picture. Uh, you can see me on the right, I didn't take this picture. I handed my camera off to a court official. Um, the person, the two people in the middle holding the baby, the person on the left uh, holding the baby's hand is, Christabel, who is someone I was in a relationship with for nine years, um, back in the 90s and, you know, up until 2004. And that is her, her wife, Amy. And, you know, Christabel and I shared a genderqueer and or trans identity, you know, when we were youngsters and together. And, you know, what's so wonderful about queer families, and it's course true of non-queer families but it's special in our queer families that we may change our relationships it's been a long time since we were a couple I'm partnered with my partner Margaret now but you know um, we have these families that go on and on and on this is last year this is at the Brooklyn courtyard uh, courtyard <laughs> courtyard courthouse and we were that was the adoption finalization of uh, my godchild royal wow let's see the photograph again so that's Royal in the center. And then Royal this is-, this is, is, this is this Christ Christabel is on the, on the left of Royal. Uh, Amy is holding Royal and that's some of their extended family. Um, and you know, we're there and they have to like go through the paperwork and sign the things. And it, it's very moving. And I think for our generation, Thomas, you know, I, I, the people I know my age who are parents of now grown children, that wasn't, they had to really imagine that into being. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, younger queers can take that for granted, but it was not accepted for our generation to be parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go to, congratulations on your godchild. Let's go, uh, Royal. Let's go to we had a second birthday party in Fort Green Park, uh, right, you know, during the shutdown, the shutdown is opening up. This is my uncle, Alan J. Pakula. He married my aunt when I was 11 years old. Her first husband died. A filmmaker. Found love. He, he directed Sophie's Choice, All the President's Men, The Parallax View, and he was a wonderful mentor. And this was, um, you know, when I was a young filmmaker and I said, I want to be a filmmaker, he said, you know, don't do it. You know, it, it's so hard, you know, do anything else. <laughs> but if you must, you must. And he gave me my first paying job on film. I was in a 
PA, lowly PA in the art department. And this was on the street. Um, they were shooting on the street a film called Orphans that Albert Finney starred in and uh -huh. Matt Levine. And all the crew had animal noses on. I don't know why. Somebody passed them out and every single crew number had crew crew member had an animal nose. And so I, you know, I, I lifted my camera and he kind of made this jokey, like I'm the director framing a shot jester with the rabbit nose on. But he's also in my film. And, you know, in my film, I lost uh, uh, five family uh, members in four years and he died in an accident in 98 very suddenly. And, you know, the loss was, you know, I, I mean, how many people who are filmmakers or artists are lucky enough to have, you know, people in their family? My mom was a writer who published many books. She was a great mentor. But, you know, I was just so lucky to have him in my life. Mm hmm and he was very accepting of, of my queer identity in a way that, you know, wasn't always true in my family. And, um, you know, he, I don't know, just, I love the, the work he did and I wish you were here today. Mm -hmm. Is a lot of it in your, in your new film, is this, this narrative or is this, is, a, a, is there another narrative? All in the film. Every single picture that I'm showing today is, is part of the trajectory of the film, which is, you know, my story and my family, but then also, you know, some larger social and political things that, that were part of my life and, and our world. So it's an essay film, a meditation. Uh, yep, yep. Great. And very much inspired by your film, That's My Face, um, mm -hmm. in Minyakara. I mean, when I saw that, that film of yours, it was really inspiring. I was like, he's poetic. It's in the first person. It's, it's political and spiritual and familial. And um, so I got to see that. Thank you so much, Jenny. Let's go to the next photograph. So, um, so this I was looks like a film still. Yeah. So I was a you know young photographer running around you know wanting to be you know Henri Cartier-Bresson or or Diane Arbus or you know all those people who were running around taking quote unquote street photographs and this was just one day Midtown Manhattan you know in in, in the eighties I don't know who that guy is but you know when you come from a more marginalized identity you know if you're queer if you're gender queer even if you're jewish you know obviously if you're black and brown or indigenous you know you you see this you think about the center in relation to you know your your identity you know you see the center as people in the center do not always see it and so you know this guy he could be the president of the united states today right i mean so, you know, and, and the picture, it's, it's what photography does, right? It's a little bit poetic. Maybe he just lit that car on fire with a cigarette, you know, who knows, um, you know, the thing that, the thing that the camera captures. And so I wanted to show it because it's, it will be in the film, but also it's very much a part of like how I looked at New York and how I looked at the world as, as a young photographer, thinking about the structures, you know, that inform and, and create and inhibit um, our lives. Mm. And again, very cinematic. Um, next, uh, next photograph. So this is the last picture I wanted to show. This is, this was taken with obviously my phone and I wanted to give a shout out to, you know, what our phones are doing for us as filmmakers and photographers. You have it in your pocket, you know, you can do it. Uh, Margaret, my partner and I went to, um, Hawaii last, uh, summer and I'd never been to Hawaii hadn't been on vacation in a really long time. It wasn't a work trip. And Good for you. <laughs> word in Hawaii is the Hawaiian language, you know, and it's it's easy for people who aren't indigenous to walk around North America and not think about the people who preceded us and are still here. Um, and But in Hawaii, the language is Hawaiian. We also went to a, a protest kind of ceremony ongoing for many, many months up in Mauna Kea some um, indigenous people, some native Hawaiians are saying, we don't want a 13th, we don't want a 14th big telescope built on our sacred ground. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's not a monolith that all, all native Hawaiians feel that way, but many do. And it just made me think about, you know, what we have to think about as North Americans and, and you know, Hawaiians are thinking about it there. You know, what, what debt do we owe to, to the people who live here who preceded us. And what can we as storytellers or as allies do to think about that? And then also I wanted to show this picture because, you know, many of us are not going anywhere. Most of us are not going anywhere. And it makes me think, you know, it's one world, all these flags, you know, we are as a world are getting through this pandemic and we will be moving around the world, hopefully in a positively transformed, you know, world when we get on the other side. 
Yeah. Also that, you know, it is one world. I mean, we're here on the earth and, you know, we're the stewards of this, of this planet, you know, and, and it sustains us and we have to sustain it. And, you know, as opposed to, you know, this, uh, the concepts of national national identity or or with other other kinds of identities you know this you know this connection to the mother earth exactly what i loved about that image as well yeah thanks so much for having me as part of this event thomas it's so so amazing it is wonderful to have you here another another marker in our long relationship <laughs> thank you for helping uh create this Career Global Family Album. <laughs> My honor and pleasure. I look forward to the film. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, so our next guest is uh, Jay Clapp. And Jay Clapp is also known as Vivica C. Cox, a pioneering drag performer and activist who brings together drag, art, and social justice in order to create an inclusive environment for the LGBT community and family. Jay, welcome. And and Jay and uh, Jay, you, you muted. You muted. So Jay was also featured in our series, Family Pictures USA in North Carolina, because you and your family are tearing it up there and charging <laughs> forward. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you. So Thank Jay, you for having me. <laughs> you're speaking from you're speaking from North Carolina, correct? Right. Yes, I am. I'm sitting in the exact living room you were in when you were filming Family Pictures USA with us down here. Wonderful. Southern hospitality. You made us feel so much at home. Thank oh, you. Oh, I'm so glad. My home is your home whenever you come. <laughs> so what's the first photograph we're going to look at today? Well, I think our first photograph here is actually of um, civil rights activist Polly Murray, who grew up here in Durham, North Carolina. And we're super proud of Polly because to have such rich Black LGBTQ plus history here in the South, in what I consider my hometown is just so magical uh, because Polly was the first really like black Episcopal woman priest mm -hmm. in the nation and to be from Durham, North Carolina, to have the education that Polly has and to have been an integral part of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. is just so inspiring. And to know that also as a law, a legal scholar, mm -hmm. that Polly helped shape the Brown v. Board um, decision and was essential in that progress. So if you're ever in Durham, North Carolina, for those viewers who aren't familiar with Durham, when you walk around, there are just murals of Polly Murray's face everywhere here because this, oh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, right, right, went, to Yale, went to Yale Law School. Uh, yeah. I don't think she, Harvard did not uh, accept, I don't think Harvard was accepting women at the time or the, some other places she had applied. And and I'm teaching at Yale right now. So that yeah. might be someone that's connected to one of my classes or not. <laughs> okay, anyway. Maybe. Well, you know, Polly was rejected from UNC Chapel Hill uh, oh. for law school, actually went to Howard for law school and got a PhD oh, right. in legal science from uh, yeah. Yale. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, thank and you. was the first black woman to do so. But what's funny is that Polly is oftentimes referred to as a woman, but if you read the documents of Polly's life, you'll mm -hmm. see that Polly was would have identified differently in 2020. Mm -hmm. And that we don't know the exact terms that Polly would have chosen, but references to I want to marry a woman, but not as another woman. Mm -hmm. were used in her writings. And that was always so powerful to know that during the civil rights movement, someone we might identify as trans today was leading the charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the same time helped create the uh, National Organization for Women at one point as well. So, I mean, all it talked about intersectional, just Absolutely. like hero. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you so, know, someone who's behind the scenes really making things happen. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Wikipedia page, you'll just see it all. But yes, it's so wonderful. Yeah, I just read the uh, the, the biography that was written, uh, uh, Song in a Weary Throat, so powerful. I mean, it was like this thick, but I just, I could not stop. It was really, really powerful. And I went to actually read uh, The Shoes in the Bed. That's, 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 I, I'm spacing the name of the, her um, her uh, uh, biography, her, her one of her first biographies. But let's go to your next photograph. <laughs> so who's in this photograph? Literally everyone, everyone is in this photograph. Um, this is 
a, a good representation of what I call family. Um, I run the House of Cox. I'm the drag mother. I'm the matriarch. And we are a social justice oriented drag family. And we produce shows. And these folks are performers and our partners. And as you can see, my grandchild is in someone's belly in this photograph. And I love my little grandchild. I'm so pleased that I can help raise this little baby. But yes, this is the House of Cox and our partners. And we just went out for a movie night and it was the most adorable moment ever because there were so many of us. We took up almost the whole theater. I love seeing all the love and happiness and joy in that photo. <laughs> Yes, we kind of love each other. And it's just a really magical notion to have a drag family because not everyone in the photo had a supportive family at home. And this is basically us recreating family. And to follow, you know, Jenny is kind of poetic right now because what we are doing is based off of work that's been happening for decades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's go to the next photograph. And I want you to tell me about socially engaged drag, which is what you do. So, so yeah. people can look at that and you have this image, which is a fantastic image, but also there's like stuff, the messages that are coming from the stage are also really. Right, there's just so much happening because it wasn't a coordinated performance, separate performances. And we just came together for a group photo at the end. Uh -huh. But you can see my children, you know, my eldest daughter with her arm up, Anita, me in the middle and our pit crew in the front. And we provide a wide array of types of entertainment, but at the center of it is racial justice, gender equality and consent. We want to have nightlife where everyone, regardless of your body, is able to enter and have a good time without fear of violation of your boundaries or anything like that. And so we actually use our pit crew, as you'll see, very, very naked in the front, as an a avenue or a resource to demonstrate what consent looks like so that people can see that you can be very sexy and still have your boundaries respected. And it brings me a lot of joy to be on that stage. Haven't been on it since March, but it brings me a lot of joy. Don, close that. Let's go to the next photograph. <laughs> I, we had some noise in the background, so I just got distracted, but let's go to the next photograph. So now this looks like you guys are at home during Christmas. Yes, we are celebrating the holidays here. Um, I, I just love this photo so much. I could not not put it in. Um, because look at how adorable we are. I Absolutely, just, and the babies come. Yes, the baby was born in this photo, so I'm like really pleased, What's and I'm as close name? to that baby as possible. Okay. <laughs> What's the baby's name? A uh, juniper. Juniper. Wow, yeah. look at that photo. I know it is the most adorable. We are such a family. We got people from all over, and it's just so wonderful to have come together as this ragtag group. Uh -huh. And it's not all about the performance. A lot of it is about these moments where we can recreate family photos that we might not have from our childhood. Are you guys characteristic of Durham and North Carolina? Is this is this what is this what people would come find when they came down there? Because a lot of people like in North Carolina, they um, they 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 banned the um, the third bathroom or new <laughs> bathroom. You're, talk <laughs> You're talking about H. <laughs> yes, a lot of people assume that because we're in North Carolina that we're in this. Um, place where we can't be happy and have full lives. But if you come to Durham, North Carolina, and we've talked about this before, what you saw in that image is what you would see in town. Durham is an exceptionally progressive place. I promise you in this election, we will be going 80 to 90% blue in the whole county, not just the city. The whole county will be going 80 to 90% blue because we're such a progressive and radical city. Um, we made national news because the queers here toppled Confederate monuments before it was cool because um, it was there was just a series of them for a while. But we were toppling Confederate monuments. We were telling the KKK, not in Durham, um, the KKK canceled their rally because we were like, mm, we're not the city for that. And it is just such a powerful place to be. It really is. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Let's go to the next photograph. I believe this is my last photo, and I, the best I could do was, was this copy of the photo um, because my family history is complicated and I don't have all of my childhood photos anymore. 
But this is an image of my mother holding myself and my brother when we were itty bitty. And yes, I've had red hair since I was a baby. This is not dyed. Um, and I that. yes, and I just love this photo so much, but mostly because as you know, Thomas, this is a photo of my brother who was murdered by police back in 2017. And I will not stop showing his face, mm. saying his name and mm. reminding people that there are little people who used to be little children who have been murdered by police. Mm -hmm. And that is a part of my story. That is a part of my family's history. And that is something I'm not gonna shy away from. But Christopher was his name, um, is so essential in my life today. It fuels me to live a full and happy life because he no longer can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for sharing your family with me once again. And um, I'm so glad we're heart connected and, um, and tell everyone I send my love. And thank you for helping us to enlarge our queer family album, bring it yeah. home to the South. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to represent the queers in the South whenever possible, because there are so many of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, be well, I'll speak to you soon. Be well. Bye bye. So um, our our next and uh, final, but not our least guest, our uh, last but not least guest is uh, CQ Quintana. Christina Quintana, CQ, is a queer writer with Cuban and Louisiana roots, whose plays have been developed and produced across the country. Welcome, CQ. Hello, I'm so I'm so honored to be here among like, geez, the legends. This is like no joke. <laughs> and you too. I mean, we met the other day in North Central Park, and That's we both amazing. had masks on. So I think if we like pass each other on the street without masks, I don't think we we recognize each other. You had a hat on too. <laughs> Luckily, we have have the glasses. That's like the helpful. It's always helpful. I was also when you all mentioned the iWorks uh the iWorks thing I've heard when I was in LA everybody was like that's where you need to go to get glasses like everybody LA iWorks LA iWorks does it yeah so tell let's let's see the first photograph that you brought yeah so you know we were talking about obviously queer histories that are meaningful um I was thinking about Alice Dunbar Nelson the poet um an activist and really um thanks to the Academy of American Poets poets.org I first came along um, Alice Dunbar Nelson's work and which is remarkably queer. I mean, you know, she lived 1875 to 1935. Um, she was a biracial woman. She was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and her work is just so, she has this one poem in particular, particular called You Inez, which is just one of the most beautiful love poems to another woman that I've ever read. Um, and it's, you know, she was married to two men actually, Paul Dunbar, as a lot of people know, the poet. Mm -hmm. um, and even her relationships to men were kind of notably queer, which is pretty amazing, especially for a woman of that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of loved what Lola was saying earlier because I think just like sort of the expansion of what queer is, is there's there's so much to what it means to be queer, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And I love, there's a book that was written about her and it was called uh, Lyrics of Sunshine and Shadow. It was actually about oh. their relationship and also about her. It was so moving. A friend of mine, Valicia, uh, 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 tuned me into it and I read it maybe about 10 years ago. It's a lovely, lovely book. I will Let's absolutely check that out. Thank you for Thank the reference. You. <laughs> Let's go to the next photograph. Uh, so this photo is it's like from, a wedding photo. It is. That's and that amazing suit, which you can kind of see, um, was actually designed by two incredible, uh, two incredible fashion designers, Darren George and Renat Brodach. Um, they were that was my gift, my wedding gift from them, and I chose this photo just because it's just so much joy. And we got married in Asbury Park um, because it's super queer. We could get married on the beach. And one of my favorite things about our wedding day, honestly, was we we stepped off of the beach and there was this this these, this lesbian couple and they looked at us and they just said, "Congratulations, we've been together for 30 years." And it was just like this incredible moment. Like it gets me teared up now, even thinking about it. Um, 
And so that's, you know, that's like our- a blessing, a blessing from the angels, right? Yeah, it really was just like the most beautiful moment. So yeah, so that's our that's our family. That's our chosen family. I love them. it. And everyone's like, they feel, it looks like they were about, it feels like a bird about to take off, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> we're all just like, uh, it just like, like brings me that photo brings me such joy. So yeah, and yeah what a what a gift that day was. It's, I've been thinking we've been thinking so much, you know, when mm. we just had our two year anniversary and just with everything with COVID going on, like yeah. what a gift to be able to get married in person with everyone there, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because it's yeah. not possible right now, you know, during yeah. this time. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the recent anniversary. Thank you. Let's go to the next photograph. So this photo is actually a still from my play Azul, which actually had its world premiere at Southern Rep in 2019, which was super exciting because that was sort of my, that was my home theater. I grew up in New Orleans. And so when they actually made the decision to produce the play, it was huge. And the play is actually for me, I thought very significant for this conversation um, because, you know, my entire family is Cuban. My parents are from opposite sides of the island. And I searched so hard for particularly stories about queer women um, in Cuba on the island. Um, and so when I couldn't find them, I made one up. And uh, I'm very lucky that I actually do have, you know, some queer men who are in my life, who are in my family. Um, but so this story in very, in a, in a lot of ways is about you know, a legacy, a queer legacy, and follows a couple both in, um, you know, a Cuban American woman, a Puerto Rican woman who are married and sort of, and this journey back to the island. Um, and so this, that's actually a scene um, from the play when they go back to Cuba, when they go uh, to Cuba. Uh, ah, yeah. now how did your family get to Louisiana as opposed to um, Miami? I know, not to be cliche. No, but <laughs> not at all. No, not at all. It's so funny. I actually, so both of my, which we'll, we can talk about, honestly, I think the next photo might be them, but. Um, oh, let's go to the next photo. Uh, so this was 2015, actually. This was my, before my father passed away. It was their last trip to New York. Um, so my parents, actually, both of their families immigrated to New York City. And it's, I wanted to share this photo in particular because I think it's special that they visited my wife and I, well, before we were married, uh, at an apartment that is actually about 10 blocks from where they met. Um, so they were actually from different opposite sides of the island. My dad was from Havana and my mom was um, from Santiago de Cuba. And um, they met in high school. Uh, they lived on opposite corners of the street at Fort Washington and 161st Street. Um, and so this photo just, it makes me smile. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of special, a special image of, you know, of where I came from, you know? Wonderful. Well, I'm so glad you had that, and I'm glad that you, you were your father and your mother both were able to celebrate, you know, their union with your you and your your wife, and you know, during that time, and that you documented that, you know, and that's really beautiful, you know. And they looked like lucky. having a blast. It was very lucky. It was very lucky. It wasn't always <laughs> easy with them, but it got to a place. Yeah. Ah, with with work. I see. Um, both. I mean, both. My family comes from. They. Uh, it's like a medical background. So I was actually like. Um, I was really loving what Jenny was saying about. I mean, how lucky to be able to have artists in your family. I like what a gift. Um, yeah. But you know, they they came they came over. They're they're okay now. They were okay. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you so much, CQ. 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 So listen, what we're gonna do right now is um, we, uh, oh no, we have one last image. That's and okay. We, this is actually some, some new work. So let's let's go to this 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 last image. Oh See. yeah, so basically I, this is just an image from, I co-run this uh, reading series called Bespoke. It's the Bespoke reading series. We've been actually running it since 2018. I run it with Tim Murphy, who is an author and a journalist and Jerome Murphy, who's a poet. And it's an all genre, all queer reading series that normally, you know, in you know non-COVID times, we operate out of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is in the center, the bookstore in the center. Mm -hmm. um, but in COVID times, yeah. And in COVID times, we actually decided to go virtual. And so since March, we've actually been doing at least every other month, we've been doing these virtual events and we've actually been doing them as fundraisers for mostly queer organizations, but all sorts of organizations. And uh, as you can see, sort of Tim is taking the photo because he didn't know how to do a screenshot. 
But um, but I wanted to share that because it felt like a significant, it's so a major part of my queer community. How can people join? I, how, oh if, yeah. So you can actually visit at Bespoke Reading Series. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, um, and we are we always update about events. We should be coming. We wanted to wait post the election, so we should be having a new event in December. Oh, I can't wait. I can't yeah. wait. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll bring something to read or you know, we could talk about that. Yeah. You would love that. That would that be amazing. Would be fabulous. Yeah. So um so CQ, thank you so much. Thank for you. Your wonderful energy and your like, you know, new new generation power. You know? <laughs> it's, been an, it's been an honor. I've been like, oh my God, like what have I done? Jeez. <laughs> I can't wait thank to see you. one of your productions. So yeah. Thank Sue. you, Thomas. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. okay, thank you. So um, so uh thanks everyone for being here. Um I don't see that many questions. I don't know, uh, Quentin, did we get some questions that we want to um, bring up or should we just close? Um, I just, someone just said, okay, we could close. So I just want to thank you again, audiences who are uh, watching this and also uh, thank every single one of our special guests. They were just amazing from California, from North Carolina, from Louisiana, Cuba, New York, <laughs> from um, you know uh, old friends, new friends, et cetera. Um, thank you for joining us for this incredible gathering. If you missed a part of the event, it will be uploaded to our Family Pictures USA Facebook group and the Family Pictures USA and Third World Newsreel YouTube channels for the foreseeable future. Uh, as part of this screening, we act, as part of this event, we also screen uh, our film Marriage Equality, Byron Rushing and the Fight for Fairness. And that will be a uh, screening. It's a short film, 17 minutes around uh, people of color who led the uh, way towards marriage equality in the Massachusetts area. Uh, so that'll be screening uh, for free until midnight tonight. And um, so make sure you take this opportunity to watch it. Uh, we'll leave a link in the stream in the comments below. If you wanna support future events like this one and help Family Pictures USA continue to transform strangers into family, please consider making a donation using the link on our Facebook Live caption. Um, Every month we do some kind of event, whether it's with archivists or we, it has a theme. Uh, next month it's gonna be military families and Thanksgiving. So uh, speaking of thanks, I wanna thank you so much Third World Newsreel, our producing partner and the documentary forum at CCNY, uh, the Black Documentary Collective for co-sponsoring this event and being in, an invaluable partner to us in this work. I'm uh, looking forward to the next one. Sending everyone a mwah, big kiss for LGBTQ history. Thank you.